Good afternoon. Welcome back to ECE 207. We're turning over a new page, literally. We're now in chapter 14. This will be new material. We've been dealing with passive devices so far this semester. This may not mean anything to you, but we have not had to supply or energize resistors, inductors, and capacitors. We didn't have to basically turn them on or power them in order to use those devices. Now we will be. We will be needing to supply power to these, this device, which is an operational amplifier. That's chapter 14, or you may have heard of these referred to as op amps. That's what we will be working on now is op amps or operational amplifiers. Chapter six, I'm sorry, homework six will deal with that material and that should be forthcoming. Let's now get started with our discussion of chapter 14. That's what I just said. It's an active device versus, let's say, a passive device, where a passive device is this resistor inductor capacitor that we've been playing with. An active device simply means it has external power and sometimes you lose sight of that fact because you don't even necessarily when you're drawing the symbol you may not show the external power supplies but you are supplying power to these devices here is the circuit symbol that we now if you were becoming bored with drawing resistors, capacitors, and inductors, now you have a new symbol that you can sketch. I know, it's so exciting. Here is our device. It's triangular in shape. There's the output, and here are the two inputs, and in this particular sketch, I have not indicated how we supply power to that device. This is the output lead. This is not necessarily called the positive lead. It's called the non-inverting lead or the non-inverting input. And this is hopefully similarly called the inverting. And these are both the inputs, meaning we have two inputs and one output with this particular device. And those inputs can be connected in various ways. And the output may actually be fed back to some of these inputs through other devices to allow for certain properties or characteristics to be achieved with this circuit element. Why do we need more circuit elements? because there's a third exam and a final. <laughs> Sorry, you may not like that. But we now, op with these devices, we can do a lot more applications or we can make many more useful circuits. For example, we might connect these in such, in such a way that we can add or subtract different signals. We may have some voltages that we want to compare or add up to each other. We could use these as summing devices. You might actually want to find the area under a curve. <laughs> Integrate. You may want to take the integral of something. Why would you want to do that? Well, maybe you have a sensor that measures velocity. You want to know position, so you integrate that velocity. 
you can now integrate signals, which here's You might be saying, well, where did he come up with this operational amplifier? These are operations, adding and integrating. You can build those capabilities out of these little triangles. That's just the circuit symbol. That's not necessarily what they physically look like. Has anyone heard of the following? Yes, you've probably all heard of a computer, but have you heard of the following computer? Analog computer. That's what you used to use these devices for, is to build a computer that would basically solve differential equations. You could interconnect a bunch of integrators, which you can make out of these. You could interconnect signals, add them up. You could scale, you could amplify signals to interconnect those and now you have this differential equation solver on your circuit board or on your bench that's electrical in nature but that might actually be simulating an aircraft. You've now scaled it so that you can now put in some voltages and see what different devices, positions, angles might do relative to that airplane and that was an analog computer. That you could do with these operational amplifiers because you're operating on these waveforms with in integrators, you're scaling signals with amplifiers, there's your operational amplifier. That's why it's called an op amp. We can do even more than just build an analog computer out of these new chapter 14 devices. We can actually perform filtering. And maybe somebody has talked about low pass, high pass. Now you maybe have those in your car or in your living room. You might have filters. Maybe you didn't know it, but you have you seen graphic equalizers or a way of emphasizing different frequency ranges in a, let's say, an audio, an audio signal. That's what you could do with these op amps. You could basically build filtering capabilities. Maybe you have, we've built a passive low pass filter in here. Do you remember when I talked about a low pass filter? I think I actually went up this step. What was a low pass filter? So I'll do it, I should have gone up the other side and then this would be the passive side and that would be the active side. Just so that you would lock into the difference. Not that that would make any difference, but if you're a visual or learner, maybe it would. An RC circuit. That RC circuit was, thank you, before I got over here on the active side. We built filters, passive filters, which were made out of passive devices, a resistor and a capacitor. Now we can make a little bit more complicated filters with these active devices, we could build up and we could interconnect these so that we could have band pass or band reject. We could have all sorts of different filtering operations that we can create. We can now amplify signals. And we can do buffering. What does that mean? Well, that may allow us to keep these subsystems in a way sort of isolated from each other or maybe one particular signal source needs a lot of current to drive a load. You now may want to have a buffer between that signaling source and the load itself or you may simply need to change impedance levels between one source and another source and that might or require buffering. If you became nervous and anxious with an RCL circuit, this is an op amp circuit. Let's analyze this. No thank you, is that what I heard? 
Do you even recognize these symbols? Maybe not. We'll maybe get to those later, but that's a bunch of transistors that are interconnected. Those blue boxes, maybe you feel a little bit more comfortable with those. That's just a schematic representation of resistors. What is this from? It's from a website. <laughs> I'm sorry. But this is, this is the configuration for a particular operational amplifier labeled the 741. That may have been designed by a particular company at the beginning, but now all bets are off and a lot of companies manufacture a 741 op amp. They basically just have to go in to this integrated circuit, create that device, that interconnected way of connecting transistors and resistors, and it will now allow us to create a device that looks or that behaves like an operational amplifier. We are not going to get into analyzing that particular device. You guys are not electrical engineers. We're going to look at it as a black box. We are going to look at it in this class from the different inputs and the output. If you look closely at this, here is pin number three. This has eight pins to it, for example. Let me go ahead and expand that maybe. There's pin three. Is that visible? Here is pin two. Those, this was the plus terminal, and this was the minus terminal on the left side of that triangle. On, a, on its side. And so now you would hook up pin two to the negative terminal, pin three of this little chip that you might plug into your circuit contains this operational amplifier and you would hook the positive and negative lead up so that you could then obtain your output waveform at pin six. I said these were active devices, here's where you would hook up your positive power supply to pin seven. Pin four would be your negative power supply. So you now basically hook up, you could think of it as the positive side of a nine volt battery to this positive, the negative side to this negative terminal, or you could put hook up a couple of batteries and then you have a minus 9 volt and a plus 9 volt to supply to this circuit and you can now go plus and minus 9 volts at, at the output. Here's what it might physically look like in terms of an implementation. Have you seen these little black chips somewhere? Those are integrated circuits in this black plastic casing or packaging, and the one on the left is eight pins. You can see the eight pins and they're counted in a funny way, but you start in the upper left and typically, well, they either have that notch in the top or they may have a dimple. Well, that's hard. That was a, not a very big, too big of a pin, but there would be an indentation at pin one. So if you looked at that chip and it didn't have a, that notch in the top, it might have a dimple on the upper left corner and that indicates pin one. Now you go down and then on around to get pins one through eight. Pins one through 14 is a different one and you might have packages that actually contain two op amps and then you have to figure out what leads go where, but once you know the different leads, you know how to power it up and you know how to put in the inputs, wire up your system with integrators, I'm sorry, with resistors and capacitors to make the filtering device that you want. And that's what we're going to learn about, is how do we connect these to do useful things. Question? Why are some of them not applicable? Why are some of those, oh, they just needed to charge you by the pin? I, not sure this one is maybe you have a particular it may be the form factor that you're interested in and you may have had 
old parts that had 14 pins, now most of those are not applicable or not appropriate or however you want to refer to it. But you essentially have, for this class, what we have to worry about, which you won't worry too much about, but I do want you to realize that these are active devices. You do have to worry about the negative power supply pin, which in this case is pin four. You won't really worry about how it's pinned up. You'll just draw your diagram and say, here's, here are the inputs, here's my output, and here are the elements around it. You'll need the positive and you'll need the inputs and the output. Here is a way to automatically control a fan. I know that's what you want in the desert. But what we would be interested in is that triangle. What do we need to hook, hook up around it? And you can see where Pin four and pin seven are connected to the plus 12 and the zero. So those, one is just more positive than the other. That's all you need for the positive supply and the negative supply. The negative supply does not have to be a negative voltage. It just has to be lower in potential than the positive. Then you have your two inputs, your non-inverting and inverting, and you have your output. And essentially what's going to happen is we are going to compare the two voltages at the input, at the two inputs, and base our decision on that. And that may or may, that will then turn this relay off or on. That's what's on the right. You don't need to know all of this. You don't have, this will be maybe question 12 on the final, but other than that, don't worry about it. No. I'm just trying to give you a feel for what you can do with these op amps. They are very helpful or fun devices to play with, we will deal with some of them. Here is a amplifier. Now if you want to go home and amplify whatever it is that you're doing, maybe it's music, maybe it's your voice, maybe you want to annoy your brother or sister or your roommates or your neighbors, you'll now put this up against the wall and start singing. Maybe, I don't know, but this is no, another way, this is an amplifier usage for the op amp. Those are our different applications. Let's now talk about how we can use those devices in an ideal setting, let's just first understand them in an ideal setting, and then maybe we'll worry about them in a little bit more realistic environment. So here is an ideal op amp. Equivalent circuit. By this we mean we want to somehow distill all of those transistors, resistors, et cetera, that I just showed you for the 741 and somebody said, where did that come from? Now you'll say, well, I can actually model that by something that I'm a little bit more comfortable with. That's this ideal op amp equivalent circuit. This you can find in figure 14.2. You don't have to go too far into chapter 14 to find this. The ideal op amp configuration is not very whoops, involved. There aren't that many things going on. What we have are two inputs. Let's say this is now input number one, V sub one, and let's say this is input number two, V sub two, with the appropriate polarities. This is now my inverting terminal, 
and this is my non-inverting terminal of my op amp. And this is my input differential voltage, V sub ID, which is simply V1 minus V sub D. I'm sorry, V sub 2. Here is our output. And in this ideal configuration, what's the impedance that those sources see? What are they connected to? If I had a voltage V1 and I applied it to those terminals, what would it see? A bare wire. What's a bare wire? Or what's another way of thinking of it? An open? It's an open circuit, isn't it? So this is now an open circuit, and what do I see if I hang something off into Never Never Land? What kind of an impedance? Infinite, right? It's an infinite input impedance, and so it's really not loading my circuit in any way. Do you recognize this? What I'm saying now is this particular ideal configuration or equivalent circuit, you now know how to analyze. Because this is just a dependent source. You've played with dependent sources before. This is now some gain, and that gain is very big, that works on this differential voltage, the voltage between V sub 1 and V sub 2. If I apply now a voltage across V1 and another voltage across V2, this op amp will take the difference of those two signals, V1 minus V2, and then it will scale it up really, really high. That's A sub OL. AOL. <laughs> Sorry. But that's the output gain, or that's the gain of this op amp. What's the output voltage V sub O relative to that dependent source? It's exactly what that dependent source is, right? It's measuring the same voltage as that dependent source. So your output voltage is just an amplified version of that difference in your input voltage. Um, two questions. Is A just a constant? Here? A is a constant, but according, so the question was, is A just a constant? And the answer is yes. Second question? Um, how is this connected to the first circuit? What, how is the left connected to the right? That's made. That's maybe the whole point, is that the way that transistor-resistor network was configured is it looks like there's really no connection, and that's the ideal configuration. Meaning, it takes, the connection is that it takes the difference of these input voltages and scales them by a, a gain A, and A is infinite, it's, or it's very big, it's 10 to the fifth. Meaning if you now have a small difference between V1 and V2, that small difference gets amplified and that's what appears at the output of your op amp. That's the connection. It's a signal connection and there's no currents flowing ideally between any of those points. Question? What is a gain? What is a gain? A gain is a way of amplifying a signal. Meaning if I gave you one volt and said, oh, put it through this gain or this amplifier, that gain or amplifier, let's say, is a thousand, then one volt would turn into a thousand volts. That's what I mean by a gain or an amplification. Question. Can you attach another amplifier to that or well, what we are going to find, learn is that we're limited in how far we can amplify signals because what do we have? We have our plus and minus supplies. 
we're never going to be able to get a signal greater than either of those supplies, meaning that particular example that I just gave with one volt and a thousand gain, we're not going to have a thousand volts coming out of an op amp. That was just to illustrate or answer the question of gain. In this case, you might have a 10 to the fifth for your amplification, but your input is in very, very small indifference. It's in microvolts. So you can, we will be connecting these together, but we want to make sure that we're still in the linear operating range or operating between our power supplies. If we are not, so if we do not have these operating in a feedback configuration, you may hit the rail is what it's called, your output may actually go to one of the supply voltage signals, either the negative voltage or the positive voltage, and we'll talk more about that as we go. But you might hit the rail, meaning if you were supplying this circuit with plus and minus nine volts and you hit the rail, what that means is you're effectively putting either plus nine volts or minus nine volts out of the output of this circuit. Let's now talk about the behavior or the characteristics of this particular part. And these characteristics are for the ideal op amp. Again, these are ideal. In reality, you can come back to a smaller, for example, we say an infinite input impedance. In reality, the input impedance will be finite. It'll be large, but it'll be finite. But in some of our analysis, we will be able to assume it's infinite for our purposes. It maybe doesn't load the network that we're connecting this to. Another characteristic is that we have infinite gain or amplification. Infinite gain for the differential signal that's being applied to the input. So we have infinite gain for the differential signal. We also, this is the ideal op amp and its characteristics. We also have zero gain for the common mode input signal. That may not mean anything to you, but think of V1 and V2 both having the same signal as sort of their nominal signal and then maybe they have some interesting behavior added on to that nominal signal. Well, the two nominals don't get amplified because we're looking at the difference between those and we would just be interested. So nominal might be three volts. Let's say V1 is three volts plus a high frequency piece of signal. Let's say V2 is three volts plus another signal. We are interested in the, those higher frequency signals difference. The common mode or the nominal signal of three volts we don't gain as we go through. They get subtracted. So there's zero gain for the common mode input signal. Another characteristic is that we have zero output impedance and ideally we have infinite bandwidth. What that means is that whatever we put in as far as a frequency doesn't get changed in its signal strength as it goes through the system. 
infinite bandwidth. In reality, as we get higher in frequency, the system will have more and more difficulty pushing that signal through. And so it will be attenuated or reduced as it passes through the system. Let me write down a big paragraph. It's maybe two sentences long. And then we'll move on to more interesting analysis. But what I want to give you now is what I will call the strength associated with these op amps. You're going to have many companies create these little devices. And they're obviously not all going to look identical. The A sub OL might be 10 to the fifth for one. You might get another one off the shelf and it's 10 to the seventh. You might get another one that's 10 to the eighth. They may vary quite a bit in some of their elementary properties. But the strength of the op amp is that if you connect these elements around them, the resulting circuit is going to look about the same. That's what this says. So let me try to say that in words. The circuits containing op amps can be made to depend on the circuit configuration. That's how R's and L's and C's are interconnected around it. That's the circuit configuration. And those, param those particular elements, values, and the parameters in the circuit but only weakly on the op amp. Meaning the values of the op amps, its input impedance, its gain, its output impedance, that it doesn't matter that those may fluctuate a little bit from op amp A, B, C, D. What's more important are the parameters that we put around them, that we interconnect these circuits with. That's good because now we're not so dependent on, wait a minute, where'd you get this op amp? Oh, I got it down at the radio shack on this road. Well, where'd you get this one? Oh, I got it somewhere else. Well, hopefully when you put them in the same circuit configuration with the same parameters, it's going to behave the same even though they're from two completely different manufactured processes. This is a good thing. So this characteristic is good, or that behavior is good, because op amps parameters, which is what I just was talking about, its input impedance, its gain, its output impedance, those actually fluctuate, can vary fairly largely actually from op amp to op amp or from unit to unit. For most useful circuits, the op amp needs to be configured to operate. with negative feedback.
So what we want to do is when we build these circuits around this little black rectangle, we want to configure it or interconnect it in such a way that we actually have negative feedback in place. You're going, what in the world is negative feedback, right? So let's talk about two different forms of feedback that hopefully you are aware of. And we'll talk about two different kinds of feedback. We'll have a positive feedback and we'll have a negative feedback. And maybe you've already experienced both of those, right? In a personal situation. That a boy. Okay, I won't repeat the last one, but the second one was negative feedback. The at a boy was positive feedback. The other one was a scolding, which was negative feedback. Well, in a more in a non interactive way in terms of personal interaction have you ever had somebody get up to talk and the microphone just starts or something starts ringing making all sorts of awful noise that's positive feedback you now have a microphone that's feeding back through the speaker and it's just reinforcing itself and making noise now, essentially. Reep. That's positive feedback. Negative feedback. What is negative feedback? Suppose you put your hand near a flame. You're going to move away from that, right? Here's the front flame. You go opposite to the flame, right? You don't keep going. If it's hot, you don't, you're not attracted to it, right? So I'm talking about a flame, hand near a flame. That's negative feedback. We want to use negative feedback, meaning in order to keep these signals well behaved, we want to basically not allow that small differential voltage to get too big. And we'll do that by negative feedback. Let's look at this, these concepts relative to this operational amplifier. And first, to do that, let's define this differential input voltage. Here's the non-inverting lead. There's the inverting lead. The differential voltage is the difference between those two. But typically what we do is we actually apply a voltage to the top. or the, to the non-inverting lead, and we apply another voltage, all relative to the same, all referenced to the same node, to the negative or the inverting lead. Let's call this V sub minus, and we'll call this V sub plus, and that's the voltage applied to the non-inverting terminal, the voltage applied to the inverting terminal we'll call V sub minus. And we want to now just relate what we're talking about relative to this differential voltage in terms, to, in terms of V plus and V minus. So if I say V plus, I'm meaning 
the voltage applied to the non-inverting terminal relative to ground. And V minus likewise to the inverting. How do we relate V sub D, V sub plus, and V sub minus? And I could have asked this after the second week. KVL, there you go. We can do KVL. KVL and KCL, well, that's what we're going to be playing with now. We'll still use those tools to analyze these circuits. If we now apply KVL, I can say, well, what if I write a KVL equation around that particular loop or in those air gaps, basically? Now I have the following. I'm going into the minus terminal of V plus. I then go into the positive terminal of V sub D. And then I go into the positive terminal of V minus, and now I'm back where I started. Question? Not that it matters, but are we not using the, um, was it passive sign convention for this? So now the passive sign convention simply means that in passive devices, we define the voltage across an element where in such a manner that if the current was going into the positive terminal, we would have a voltage drop. So the current is going into the positive terminal of our device. But it really doesn't matter in this particular case. We just need to know what voltage is applied to the non-inverting lead and what voltage is applied to the inverting lead. That's all we need to know for now. And the passive sign convention, this is no longer a two-terminal device. This is a three-terminal device. We have two inputs and one output. If we now solve this for V sub D, we want to find what that is. V sub D, if we keep that on the left and push everything else on the right, we now have V plus minus V minus or V sub D is going to be the difference between the voltage applied to the non-inverting input and the inverting input. The difference between the non-inverting and the inverting input. That's what V sub D represents. And so if I now say V sub D, that's going to be What's this voltage difference between the non-inverting and the inverting terminals of my operational amplifier? Let's hook up a particular op amp to illustrate negative feedback. And really the reason that we're doing this is so that we can operate these op amps in, a, in their linear operating range. We do not want to hit the rails, is the idea. Here is my op amp. Here's my output. And I'm actually going to connect the non-inverting lead to my reference node or to ground. And I'm going to hook up my inverting terminal through a resistor to my source voltage, V sub S. And I'm also, so here's my output voltage, V sub O. I'm also going to connect by a resistor or a signal carrying path. Let's call this R sub 2. I'm going to connect the output back to the input terminal. Maybe I don't know what's going to happen between V sub S and V sub O. So let's just look at what happens from right at the, right next to the inverting terminal of that op amp, and we'll call that V sub X. This difference is V sub D. And now we want to try to get a feel for what it means to be, this is actually a negative feedback 
configuration. Let's try to explain that or understand that. To do that, let's suppose. Is V sub D negative? V sub D is simply the difference between the voltage at the non-inverting minus the voltage at the inverting terminal. So it doesn't matter where they are. So it doesn't matter where they are in terms of potentials or voltages. We just now have defined V sub D to be the difference between the non-inverting voltage level and the inverting voltage level. That's all V sub D is. Okay, so V sub D will just be whatever it ends up being, but it's relative to the non-inverting minus the inverting voltages. For now, for argument purposes, let's suppose that V sub X is positive. We know by definition what the output is because this is an op amp. Well, what did we say VO was? We said whatever V sub D is, it's going to get scaled by this large amount and that will become V sub O. This is one way of thinking about what's going on in the circuit. If V sub X is positive, then this output goes to a large initially. I mean, these will all hit steady state very quickly, but you can think through the process by saying, well, V sub O is going to go to a large negative value for the following reason. If we apply KVL here, I can do that, correct? I can go up through V sub X or through that air gap and then across the terminals and then I'm back to where I started because I have a wire from the non-inverting pin or lead to the location where I started. And what would my KVL equation be? It would see be minus V sub X minus V sub D is equal to zero. We're trying to convince ourselves that this last statement that I made is true. I, n I have just said that minus V sub X minus V sub D is equal to zero by KVL. So there's minus V sub D, the way that we're entering or labeling that op amp. This now says that V sub X is minus V sub D. So if V sub X was positive, then minus V sub D is positive or V sub D is negative, right? So, or we could say that V sub D is equal to minus V sub X. And what did we just say V naught was? V naught was A sub O L times V sub D, but V sub D is just minus V sub X. That's why we can say that if V sub X is positive, V sub O is going to become a large negative initially. If that's the case, what's it trying to do? If we go back to this diagram, at the instant that V sub X is positive, that creates a large negative at V naught. What's R2 doing? It's actually trying to push that negative voltage that it sees back around to V sub X. If V sub X was positive, it's actually saying get smaller. 
gets smaller with this large negative signal that it's applying back through R sub 2. So R sub 2 feeds back some of the large negative output voltage to the inverting input terminal which tries to force the positive V sub X value <coughs> towards zero. Or another way of thinking of that is that it's now in a V sub X is being asked to move in a direction opposite or negative to the positive value of V sub X. And what we want to do for these circuits to be making sense when we analyze them, we would like to be operating in the linear operating range or with a negative feedback configuration. We may actually connect some. I don't know if we will in this class, but it might be desirable in some cases to actually make a comparator circuit in a sense that would rail. If you have a positive voltage at V sub D, you may want to go to plus 9. If you have a negative voltage, you might want to go to minus 9. That might be to your advantage or benefit. In this class, we'll be dealing mostly with circuits that are operating in the linear range, and that's going to be possible if we have negative feedback. And I've tried to just explain that it would be nice if you could always check if your circuit was in a negative feedback configuration, but sometimes maybe a better way to do it is to analyze the circuit and if the answer that you get turns out to be bigger than the rail, then you know you're not in the linear operating range. So let's say your power supplies were at minus 9 volts and plus 9 volts, you do some analysis and you come up with an output of, minus, or of plus 20. You go, wait a minute, that's not physically possible because my output or my supply voltages are plus 9 and minus 9. I can only go to plus 9. So I must not be operating in the linear operating range. It would be nice if we could always check, but if that result occurs, then we know we're not in the linear range and we can say, okay, now let's go back and analyze this as if we're not in the linear operating range. Question. You might get 18 as a differential. The question was, can you get 18 volts out? But if you're relative, if you're relating everything to the same reference node as the minus 9 and the plus 9, you'll only be able to go between those two limits. So there might be a net voltage difference of 18 between minus 9 and plus 9, but relative to the reference location, coming out of the output, you can only swing that output between minus 9 and plus 9 relative to the same reference node location. So that output will swing maybe from minus 9 to plus 9, which is an 18 volt difference, but it will never go beyond minus 9 or plus 9 in its value relative to the reference node that you're after. So we're always going to check to make sure 
the circuit contains negative feedback or will determine that it wasn't in negative feedback and then our assumptions that we use to analyze the circuit will have to throw away and start over. So always check to make sure the circuit contains negative feedback before performing this circuit analysis. If we have negative feedback or if we're operating in a negative feedback condition or state, then we will be able to use the following constraint that the book calls the summing point constraint. What we can do is just assume this is true and if we find out that we're violating our output with respect to the rails, then we go back and say, okay, the summing point constraint has been violated, we can't use them. If we use the summing point constraint, what that says is the following that you have two conditions. V sub D is zero. What was V sub D? The difference between the positive or the inverting and the non-inverting leads or points or nodes or pins was zero. Between those two pins is zero volts. That's what the summing point constraint says. So our voltage between and that's what the negative feedback does. It ensures that condition is true. So we have a voltage between the input terminals being forced to zero with the summing point constraint. That's really the summing point constraint. This other assumption or condition is true unless we damage the device and that is that the input currents to the op amp is or are zero. Meaning going into those two pins is zero current. Question. It looks kind of like a diode. Is this a similar idea to a diode? This is not, the question was this symbol looks like a diode and it does look sort of like a diode. It doesn't have a horizontal or vertical line associated with it. The diode symbol is more like that or a Zener diode that might look something like that. This one doesn't have, whoops, doesn't have that vertical line associated with it the way I've drawn the triangle here. And the diode is only a two terminal device. We have a three terminal device. We have two inputs and one output. But doesn't that also block so a diode you can think of as a valve and it will only allow current to flow in one direction and we'll get to diodes hopefully later. But there are basically a bunch of diodes inside transistors. Transistors are used to build op amps. What we're doing now is we're taking more of a black box perspective and saying let's not get into the details of how these work. Let's look at how they work from an external black box configuration or from that perspective and let's use these to our benefit to make useful circuits, filters, buffers, summers, integrators. We want to design pieces around these ideal parts to our benefit. Let me see how well you're following along. So I, this is a class participation. Oh. Here's my op amp. Now it's a box
R2 is the resistor, the horizontal resistor up top. And these particular signals that I'm indicating, you can write your equations in terms of. Here's, let's say, I1. question was why am I drawing the black or the op amp like a box I don't know because I got tired of drawing it like a triangle but that's what it is it's now the op amp if you want to draw it like a triangle you may I just thought this configuration was more or this structure was more like what I don't know why I did that that's a good question so here whoops I thought I had it red You can correct your paper, that's fine. You won't lose points if you draw it as a box or as a triangle. That's an op amp. And what are we assuming? We are assuming that the current going in here is zero. Oh, that's pretty small. Well, the current is pretty small, but it's supposed to be zero. And this voltage from here to there is our differential voltage. That's zero volts between those two. What I want you to do is I want you to apply KVL to that loop. Let me call that loop one. And I want you to apply KVL to this loop. And I want your answers to contain V1, I1, R1, R2, V0. So apply KVL to mesh 1 and mesh 2. Is it clear what I'm asking? I want it to contain none of the red things, the blue things, the R's, R1 and R2, I1 and I2, and V. 1 and V0. Question. So this, I didn't even label those. That's a valid point. Typically this would be the non-inverting terminal and this would be the inverting terminal. You don't really need to know that per se if I'm now saying that's 0 volts between those two terminals, but that implies that particular configuration. The input current to both terminals is zero. And the input current to both terminals is zero. So if, and you could make that either direction. You could either have it going in or out. It doesn't really matter, does it? Because it's zero. But if you think of one coming in or one coming out, it's zero. So if I now say, well, actually, that current was going in to the non-inverting, okay, it's going in. Turn your arrow around, it's still zero. Does that make any sense? So there's your circuit. I want you to write, I'm asking for two equations, aren't I? You have one equation for mesh one, a second equation for mesh two, or loop and I want your equations to contain V1, R1, R2, I sub 1, I sub 2, and V sub 0. And you should come up with two unique equations because you're writing two KVL equations. Is this a trick question? And the answer is no. This should be a give me. This should be a, a gift. But I want to make sure that we're on the same page. That's the whole point of these class participations. It's not so much whether or not you get it right or wrong. It's whether or not you get it. If you don't get it, I would like to know that. 
Ideally, I could instantly scan these and get feedback. If you all had your clickers, I could just ask you, A, B, C, or D, and you could answer. Then I would say, okay, A, B, C, or D on the next one, and you could answer. And then, we would, then I would know whether to back up or to keep going. Are we finished? Okay, I, I will assume that was a yes. You've all voted and you've now given me your vote. So you can pass those in the appropriate direction. And what I would like to finish with today is show you what kind of a operation this particular configuration represents. What are we doing between V1 and V0? What are we doing to change V1 to create V out? Or what's happening at V out based on what's at V1? So if we apply KVL to that, I hope that it wasn't too difficult to apply that in mesh one. We just go into the negative terminal of V1, that's minus V1. Then we proceed in the positive direction that we've indicated for R or I sub 1 and that voltage drop will be R sub 1 I sub 1. So we now have that will be plus R sub 1 I sub 1. What's left? Nothing. Nothing. Now we drop through that zero and then we drop through the non-inverting terminal which is immediately connected to ground. We're back to where we started. That's the first equation. It's that easy. Okay, for number two, mesh two, it's likewise that easy. If we go up the left side, what have we experienced? <coughs> Nothing, correct? We go all the way up to the second resistor before we start seeing anything happening. And then we have a drop, a drop given by the product R sub two times I sub two. And then what are we going to do? Then we'll drop down through that plus output voltage, plus V sub zero, and then we're back to where we started. What I just said, I hope, was that we have R sub two I sub two plus V naught is equal to zero. Is that okay? So those were the two equations that I wanted. You could actually rewrite that. You could say, oh, V one is R sub one I sub one based on that KVL. And you could say this one is now V naught is minus R sub two I sub two. But what do we know about I one and I two? I didn't ask for that. So now we're going on. I just wanted you to basically find these two equations. This gives us two relationships for the various variables. But now we can go back to that op amp and look at one more relationship. And that one more relationship concerns that particular node. What do we know happens at that node? No charge accumulates, does it? We know KCL is true. If KCL is obeyed at that circled node, we now know that I1 is going in. What's going out? red I and I sub 2, right? I'm just having fun with colors. So KCL at the magenta node. What did I just say? Going in was I1. Going out was red eye, which was nothing, right? And another one leaving was I sub two. So now we know I one is equal to I two. So let's now take these guys. Those relationships are true. Those are valid. Let's solve those for I1 and I2, and then set those equal to each other. 
from the top one, we have the following. We have I1 is equal to, so the top equation gives us I1 is equal to V1 over R1. And from the bottom relationship, we have I2 is equal to minus V0 over R2. Did I do the right algebra? Now, from my KCL equation, which was this, I now know that V1 over R1 must equal minus V0 over R2. That's what I want. That's what I'm going to write down. So now I have V1 over R1 is equal to minus V0 over R2. That's a true relationship, but typically we write that in terms of the output voltage equaling something related to the input voltage. Let's now multiply both sides through by a minus R sub 2 and keep the V naught and move the V naught to the left. Or I now have V naught is minus R sub 2 over R1 V1. What have we just built? If you get nothing more out of this class, you now know how to build an inverting amplifier. Take two, two, take two resistors. Take one op amp. <laughs> Shake them in this way. Configure them in this way. And you now have an inverting op amp. You now have a way to scale an input signal. Let's say you have a two volt input that's fluctuating and you want to scale that by a factor of three. Now you can with this particular circuit. As long as you don't expect to go beyond your rails, you will have this linear inverting relationship between your input and the output. We've now built a new circuit. Question. What does it invert? If I said, what does an inverting amplifier look like? And if I said, what if your input signal was like this? I don't know why I did that. That's going to be terrible for me to try to draw. But let's say this is now the input. That's V1. What happens if we invert that? It just is the opposite, isn't it? So now I have this. So this is now V0. But what did I not do? I didn't amplify it. Now my R2 and R1 are the same. They're equal. I now have minus 1 for my amplification. Is that clear? If I picked R2 bigger than R1 by a factor of 2, then the red is, it has grown by a factor of 2. We'll start at that point on Thursday.